Okay, in this video I'm going to do four examples of conditional probability. The first question is, two cards are drawn from a standard deck. What's the probability both are hearts? So we're looking at the chance that the first card is a heart, and then the second card is a heart. So that is a heart on the first draw and a heart on the second, given a heart on the first. Now the chance the first card's a heart, that'd be 13 out of 52. There are 13 hearts out of 52 cards. And the chance the second card is a heart, well that'd be 12 out of 51, because there would be 12 hearts left in the deck and only 51 cards total if you had gotten a heart on the first draw. Now we can reduce this fraction. A bunch of factors are going to cancel. And this is our final answer. The probability is 1 over 17. Now this fraction 12 over 51, this is an example of a conditional probability. It's the probability of getting a heart on the second draw given we got a heart on the first. So if we write P A slash B like this, this is the probability of the event A given that the event B occurred. Or you could say the probability of A if B occurred or assuming B occurred. All right. Let's move to our second example. Number two, a particular disease will strike one out of a thousand people. A test used to diagnose the disease will positively identify the disease in 99% of the people who are afflicted. Also, if a person is healthy, that is, doesn't have the disease, the test will identify this 99% of the time. The table below illustrates the possibilities as described. Now you see we have a column for the total number of people that are sick, for the total number that are healthy, and for a total, we have a column. And we also have rows for the number of people that actually have a, a positive test result, the number of people that have a negative test result, meaning they don't have, the, anyway, the test shows that they don't have the disease, uh, and we have uh, a row of totals. Um, also notice that the original question said that the disease will strike one out of a thousand, but then in my total here, I have 100,000. So there would actually be 100 people that have the disease in 100,000 because there's one in every thousand that would have the disease. Now each of these boxes in this table can be interpreted like an and, like the first box, sick and test positive. These are people that are actually sick, they do have the disease, and they tested positive. Underneath that you have a 1. That's the number of people that were sick, but they tested negative. It means the test missed the fact that they had the disease. That is a false negative. They actually are sick, but they're testing negative. Look at the 999 here. This is the number of people that are healthy, but they actually test positive. Those 990 healthy that test positive, they're healthy, but the test shows they have the disease, indicates falsely that they have the disease. That's a false positive. Now let's get to question A. If a person has the disease, what is the probability they will test positive? That is, the probability of testing positive given they have the disease. So we'll look at the total number that have the disease, that is, the total number that are sick, that have the disease. And we'll look at, and that was 100 people that are sick, total. And we'll look at how many of those actually tested positive. That was 99. And so 99 divided by 100, that's 99%. And certainly this is no surprise that we get this answer because it said a test used to diagnose the disease will positively identify the disease in 99% of the people who are afflicted. Okay, so the next question. What is the probability that a person has the disease if they test positive? How many have the disease given they test positive? So we'll start with the total number that tests positive, 1,098 people test positive. The total number of people that tested positive is 1,098. And of those that tested positive, how many of them have the disease? That is, how many are sick? and that's the 99. Just staying on that one row, all the people that tested positive. So we got 99 out of 1,098, that's 
So there's our answer to B, 9%. So look at the big difference between part A, what's the probability that you test positive if you have the disease, and part B, what's the chance that you have the disease given that you test positive? Okay, let's look at the third example. Suppose a certain disease has a 3% incidence rate. Suppose a diagnostic test for the disease has a 5% false positive rate and a 4% false negative rate. And the questions are part A, if a person tests positive, what's the probability they have the disease? And B, if a person tests negative, what's the probability they don't have the disease? So I love to look at how probability really provides us these sort of mathematical, logical, deductive rules for dealing with uncertainties like this. Uncertainties that we could really face in real life. So I'm going to start with this 3% incidence rate to say the probability of the disease in the population is 3%. So 3% is 0 0.03. That's 3 out of 100 on average. So I'm going to use that to create a table that agrees with all these percentages and probabilities I have. So I'll make a row for people that have the disease and people that don't have the disease in a population, in a sample population basically. My table represents a sample population. So I'll have a row for total, for totals, and then uh, columns for people in the population that test positive, those that test negative, and another column for totals. So I can make this sample population represent any uh, total that I want, and I'll just use 100 because that's convenient from the given incidence rate. So in the incidence rate, if I took 100 people, three of them would have the disease in a sample population. So I'll set up the table to agree with that probability. If I had 100 people total, three have the disease, and therefore 97 don't. Now, this box here is the false positives. These are people that are testing positive, but they don't have the disease. That's why it's false positive. So false positive goes here. False positive rate is 5%. So that means of the people that don't have the disease, 5% are testing positive. So 5% is 0.05, 5% 5 of 97 in a population of 100. 5% of 97 that actually don't have the disease, that's 4.85 in this sample population. That's 4.85 that are false positives. 4.85 statistically speaking. All right, now I'm going to look at the false negatives. So they're testing negative, but they actually have the disease. So it's a false negative. The test says negative, but they actually have the disease. So false negatives go here. And the false negative rate, that says 4%. So 4% of the people that actually have the disease are going to come up with a negative test result according to this uh, di directions. So 4% of those three people, that's 0.12 people on average in a population of 100 is what that really represents. So once you have these false negatives and false positives, you could just do subtraction. 3 minus 0.12, that's 2.12. So those are the, in the population of 100, there would be 2.88 on average that actually are, have the disease and test positive. Here I'm subtracting 97 minus 4.85 to fill in that box. And then I get my totals, 2.88 plus 4.85, that's 7.73. 0 0.12 plus 92.15. That's 92.27, and you could check 7.73 plus 92.27, that adds up to 100. All right, so that's the information that we'll need to actually answer these questions. So now we'll look at the question, if a person tests positive, what is the probability they have the disease? So if you test positive, that's given. What's the chance you have the disease? So the probability that they have the disease is the event we're looking at. The probability of the disease given the person test positive. So under the assumption that the person tests positive, assuming they test positive, what's the probability of the disease? 
well, how many people tested positive in this sample population of 100? The actual number that test positive is 7.73 on average out of 100. So 7.73 people testing positive, how many of them actually have the disease? That's 2.88. So 2.88 on average out of 7.73, this is approximately 0.373, and that means about 37.3%. Would have been really tough to have come up with that number based on just the given information without looking at it in this table. Okay, question B. If a person tests negative, what's the probability they don't have the disease? So I'm looking at the chance that a person has no disease assuming that they tested negative. So how many people in this sample population test negative? That's 92.27 that test negative. And out of those 92.27, how many don't actually have the disease in this population we would have 92.15 on average so 92.15 out of 92.27 this is approximately rounding off to let's say three places 0.999 and therefore 99 percent or 99.9 .9 percent I'm sorry all right so there's my answers so I just think a really neat example how we can deal with these uncertainties. It's 3% chance of person having the disease in a population and uncertainties in the test. A 5% false positive rate, 4% false negative rate. But then we can still make a organize, organize the information, make a conclusion. If you tested positive, what's the chance you have the disease? That's 37.3%. And if you test the negative, what's the chance that you don't have the disease? That's the 99.9% .9 chance. Okay, last example, number four. Suppose a city has a population of a million people and one of them commits a crime. Suppose the police collect physical evidence at the scene and from the entire population of a million people, there are ten people who match the description and physical evidence collected at the scene. Suppose that of those ten people, only one is the actual perpetrator and the other nine are completely innocent. Suppose there are no other details available regarding the circumstances of the crime. However, one of the suspects is charged, brought to trial. First question, part A. If a suspect is innocent, what's the probability that person matches the evidence? Question B. If the suspect matches the evidence, what's the probability they are innocent? So I'm going to take the information that I've got and make a table very much the same way that I did the previous examples. I'll have a row here for the number of people that match the evidence and number of people that don't match the evidence and I'll make a row for totals. I'll make columns for the number of people in a sample that are guilty and not guilty and that's really the same here as just innocent and a column for totals. So I'm going to use this table uh, to represent the total population of a million people in the city. So if I had one million people in the city, I start with that total there. And of those one million, it says in the question that there's one person who's actually guilty and they match the evidence. Now if I had one guilty, and 10 total that match the evidence, there must be 9 that are not guilty. 1 plus 9 makes 10 total. Now if there's one person who's guilty and that one person matches the evidence, then the box underneath that for guilty and no match, that has to be 0 because there's nobody who's guilty that doesn't match the evidence. And the 1 plus 0, that makes a total of 1. Well, the next step I'll make here, filling out the table, is that I'll get the total number of people who are no match on the evidence. I know that there are 10 people that do match the evidence so out of a million, so I'll take the 1 million people minus 10, and that gives me 999,990 total that don't match the evidence. Now we'll just do 
addition or subtraction to get this total row for no match. The 0 plus 999,990 adds up to the total. And then vertically, the total column for not guilty has to be 999,999. Those two will add up. The 1 plus 999,999 across the bottom will make the total 1 million. Now I can use this table to go and answer the questions. So the first question is, if the suspect is innocent, what is the probability that person matches the evidence? So I'm looking for the probability they match the evidence given they're innocent. So innocent here is the same as not guilty. So how many people do I have total innocent? Not just innocent and match the evidence. I mean really completely innocent um, from the very beginning. That's 999,999 that are actually innocent in the population. So if the person is completely innocent, what is the chance they match the evidence? I start with the total number of people that are innocent and how many of them actually match the evidence. Of those people that are innocent, there are nine that match the evidence. So nine divided by 999,999 is approximately 0 0.00000. Nine. This is about 0 0.009 percent. Uh, a very, very small probability. This is the kind of reasoning that a prosecutor could use to make the person on trial actually look guilty. They could say that if you are innocent, as you might claim, the chance that you match the evidence is extremely small but you did match the evidence and therefore you really look guilty. It looks like very unlikely that if you were actually innocent you would actually match the evidence. But you do match the evidence, the, the prosecutor would argue, and therefore you look guilty. So now we'll look at the other question. What's the probability the person is innocent if they match the evidence? So innocent given matching the evidence. So what's the total number of people that match the evidence? Total number of people that match the evidence, there are 10 people that match the evidence. So that is the number that goes on the bottom. Of the 10 people that match the evidence, how many of them are innocent? Nine. So nine divided by 10, that's 0.9 and 90 percent. A drastically different answer. The questions might almost sound the same, parts A and B. So this example illustrates what's called the prosecutor's fallacy. It's a scenario in which a prosecutor could argue in part A here that if a suspect was actually innocent, the probability they match particular evidence is really, really small and therefore seems very unlikely if they were innocent to match the evidence and use that to make an argument that the person actually is the guilty person who's um, the perpetrator. So if you are really innocent, the prosecutor says, the chance of matching the evidence is so small that I don't believe that's what happened. It's unlikely. Uh, and so therefore, I believe that you are actually guilty. Uh, and then, of course, the real question that the jury should really consider is in question B. The evidence is already established, so if the person does match the evidence, the real question is, what is the chance they're innocent? You can see that's a hugely different answer. In this case, completely unfair to pick this one person put them on trial. Uh, there were ten people that matched the evidence. And nine of them were innocent. Um, there was a very good chance that if you just pick somebody from the ten that matched the evidence, you're actually picking an innocent person. Okay, so that's the end of the example. I'll stop here.